Hello everyone, this is Tim, and this is going to be my third part of the review of Red Tide from Scene Nominee Publishing. And I don't think I actually read the back of this, so we'll do it uh, Kurt Regal style, read the back, <laughs> get that out of the way. A red tide is rising. For 300 years, the last remnants of humanity have clung to the wild green jungles of the Sunset Isles. They have watched the red mist that consumed their world royal a hundred miles off the coast waiting a beast at bay but now the crimson dreams are becoming stronger and the wild shall tribes of the west howl their hate at the human invaders who shall rise to save a world quenched in blood in this book a labyrinth lord or gm will find all that is required to run a sandbox campaign of adventure in the sunset isles in addition to the races classes and sorcery of the savage land a referee will find special tools and resources for creating shadowed courts of quarreling nobility, cities rife with struggle, wild border settlements that cry out for the help of heroes, and dark places in the earth known only to the dead and the damned. These tools will aid not only campaigns in the Sunset Isles, but also those games in other lands of savage mystery and blood-stained blades. So, has a nice little blurb on the back there. The section I'm at now in the review is the Houses of the Lost. And there's a few quotes from this. As in every sandbox campaign, both the players and the GM need to do their own share of the work to bring out all the fun that the game can provide. So in a sandbox campaign, the players have a role to play. They have some work that needs done. The first and most important element of a sandbox campaign is something that isn't there namely an overarching plot. So to run a sandbox campaign is a little bit different than say maybe a campaign that you're used to running and you have like the idea of how things are going to work out and that's not the case with the, uh, the way this is you know, set up to be a sandbox. The second element of a sandbox game is that it is about what the players do. So again you need some proactive players to get in there and make some decisions and you know have the consequences come down on them or be good consequences. Uh, the third element of the sandbox campaign is that it is alive. Things happen even when the PCs aren't there to see them. Actions have reactions and choices have logical consequences. And a lot of these decisions drive what happens in the campaign. Another quote. The players regularly experience the consequences of their past choices, good and bad, and also see those choices play out in the world around them. NPCs act as their goals indicate. So what that kind of shows you is if you are going to do prep for a sandbox campaign, come up with your NPCs, stat them out, figure out what on earth they want to try to accomplish, and that is what they do. And if they are not stopped you know, by the players, maybe, maybe some NPC factions sort of make them do it in a different way or uh, give them some resistance, but otherwise those goals are more than likely going to happen. So you got to kind of keep that in your head, you know, just kind of, tick the clock ahead a few you know, weeks or uh, years, depending on how you run a campaign, and see if those goals come to, come to pass. And that might be something that the players will have to deal with in the future <laughs> if they don't stop it you know, right, right now. Sandbox campaigns are susceptible to going down in flames if some of the participants don't quite understand what is expected of them. So if you have more passive players, people that don't want to sort of drive the story on, and that can be a problem for a sandbox campaign. Players need to drive the campaign and have character goals they will work towards. Players should not rely on the GM to nudge or push them. Um, and again, just be proactive as players. The world is not equal to your character level. <laughs> Things are dangerous. Uh, if you don't research or look into something, uh, don't expect it to you know, equal uh, a certain challenge rating. Um, you should be prepared to run away. <laughs> Uh, and don't just go headlong into combat and everything that you bump into. Uh, this sort of game, at least the way that uh, the author is putting it forth, there's no plot armor uh, or script immunity. So, you know, there is lethality. So because there's no overarching plot, you're not going to have, like, one of the characters be the chosen one. Uh, so it doesn't matter if that character dies, you know. It's just, uh, it's just the story that emerges is the one that you're telling at the table. It. It just happens. It's not something that you plan ahead of time. GM needs to prepare the sandbox ahead of time, like I said, with NPCs, groups, factions, um, 
things that are in certain places, like the, the main cities I went over, those are there. This uh, suggested as being uh, having some things just ready, like uh, like a small village, or here's our ruined temple. And if uh, you know you're kind of running out of ideas or you don't have anything prepped, you can pull that out. So um, even though it says to prepare it all ahead of time, um, uh, like a true sandbox, you pretty much have everything figured out where it is, and then they bump into it as they go. So you know there's a little bit of flexibility there. He talks about GM Binder, how to fill it with like people, places, encounters, uh, chronicle, like what has happened so far, and maps. And as far as GM Binders go, I've actually been trying to work on one for uh, some future 5th edition campaign, Deep Dungeons and Dragons. And it's it can be a lot of work if you want to put a, a bunch of random charts in there, uh, pictures, things that inspire you. So you know, that can be, that's probably a video in and of itself, but, <laughs> but it's something to think about. Um, goes through and lists a bunch of sites, court, urban, borderland, ruins, and um, you know, they're basically handy to, to throw in there when you need them. Uh, so it suggests making one of the cities as the home base for a campaign. Uh, it also suggests the GM should be more uh, active, you know, more of a, take a more of an active role in the first adventure, and then sort of step back a little bit and let the players be more proactive. Especially that is probably true if um, your players are used to sort of, you know, having the hook in their mouth and being drug along everywhere. Uh, sort of like baby steps into a sandbox campaign. Uh, keep your prep updated as you go. I mean, make sure to take good notes. That's sometimes where I fall a little short, but uh, you can record sessions and later take notes. I do that sometimes. Uh, things should happen that have nothing to do with the characters. Like I said, it's, it's a living world that's going on. There's a bunch of court sites that are listed and random tables there. There's borderland sites that it goes through. Uh, all kinds of different things that you can include. There's random tables. And there's tags. This is kind of interesting. These are sort of, uh, sort of, they're already fleshed out and you can associate a certain tag with a certain site. And it, it adds a little bit more flavor, gives a little bit more detail. And it's pretty much all done for you, so that's very handy. Um, I love the, the back of this, this book. Yes, it's all set up for the campaign in the Sunset Isles, but it would not be very hard to take this sort of approach and apply it to any sandbox campaign. Just see how he does it, uh, reskin some of the definitions and descriptions of some of these things, and I think it'd be very handy. So even if you didn't want to run a campaign in the Sunset Isles with the, the Red Mist coming and all that kind of stuff, it, I think it'd be a very useful book to have at the table, or at least a book that you could use during your GM prep session. All right, uh, has the uh, city sites, and there are four big cities. There's Zian, uh, Honberg, Tianlong, and Kitamanatu. And these kind of go and show you a little bit of like how you can flesh them out a little bit more. Talks about how there's uh, external and internal walls, and how those internal walls make various subsections of the city, make each section feel a little bit different. Uh, also, I would suggest, um, Zach S.'s book of Vornheim to kind of flesh out some of the city's like details and sections, especially if you want to run a little bit more on the fly, just sort of roll in some random tables and get some ideas from that. Uh, let's see what else they got in there. But yeah, there's there's 20 different tags listed for the city sites, and again, these are all fleshed out ideas you can just run with, uh, provide like a various flavor for wherever you're at. There are ruin sites, and talks a little bit about those. There's a bestiary and encounters, um, and I like that the encounters and the, uh, the beasts have various twists, and it can make each encounter with that creature a little different. So, you know, you might be bumping into the shallow again, but, you know, you roll on the table and, or you pick one, and, okay, this time they're like this, or this time they're trying to go for this. Or, you know, it, it, it gives a little bit of a variety, I guess, to each of the little creatures, and I thought that was a cool little thing. Um... I think my favorite are the Tide Cultists, where they sort of make sacrifices to the Red Tide. They get these strange dreams. So, again, I think that's uh, <laughs> those are the things that you know, the Tide Cultists, the Tide Spawn, uh, sort of like the demonic or weird stuff going on. It's something that I really like about this setting. It uh, adds a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, you know what the hell is going on, uh, strange things, weirdness that you can throw in there. Uh, and I just like dreams, so that could be, that could be fun, too, as a GM to maybe try to tempt some of the players with the dreams of the mist and you know, maybe they don't doesn't really latch onto them but it sort of just dangles out there like 
you know, whenever they need power or, uh, <laughs> I don't know, you could have a lot of fun with that as, with a GM, I think. Uh, okay, and the last section, well, I guess almost last section, is Secrets of the Mist. And players should avoid this section at all costs. Uh, it's lots of spoilers for some of the things that are going on behind the scenes. As a GM, I really enjoyed reading this. It, uh, you know, like, oh my, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to review that in the video itself. I'm sure you can, it's a free download. You can go check it out if you want. But, you know, I, I wouldn't do it if I was a player. It did give me a, an evil GM grin a few times, and <laughs> I can tell that, uh, again, I like the writing. It just uh, it just speaks to me. It uh, makes me want to run the setting. So, I mean, it's, that's what you want in an RPG book. Last section is game resources, and it's just to also download Stars Without Number, which is a OSR sci-fi game for various random tables that can you know be used for the GM. That you know, while that book is sci-fi, there's some that are kind of genre neutral, I guess, and that's what he suggests to, to pick up. So again, that's also uh, free download. I'll try to put a link down below. But there's naming tables pronunciation guides which you know I butcher language so that's always kind of nice to have those in there even though even when I have them I tend to I'm just not very good with language so it kind of goes in one ear and out the other but but it's there if you need to try, try to brush up on that there is clothing and cuisine listed for each of the various cultures like the dwarven Erangard, elven Eshkanti, gadal halfling imperial the ku the shao and the skander there's businesses, NPC generation, room dressing tables that reminded me of the AD&D First Edition Dungeon Master's Guide, maps and mapping. There are some generic maps that are sort of given there, so you can make them a little village or a little temple. You know, things like adventure sites you can throw in there if, if things are a little slow. So, so again, it's it, it it's it's very much like pushing that sandbox thing, but it's kind of hedging its bets bets a little bit with some of this prep work. Where you can throw something in if you need, uh, you know, something for the, the players to to deal with, and it's it's helpful to have some maps. I would suggest going online. There's plenty of maps out there. There's lots of Google Plus groups of uh, you know various map cartography guilds and so forth. And really, I don't know about you, but my Google Plus feed is like almost all gamers. So I have all kinds of images, like way more than I'll ever need on my hard drive. <laughs> Probably too much to even uh, usefully. Uh, you know, <laughs> take and actually, you know, use in a campaign. There's just too much there. I have to organize them. But yeah, look online for resources like that. There is a, a hex map of the island. And again, I, the, the, the key is a little too small, but I like that this looks like it's like hexographer and you can, you know, color it in or, uh, you know, just, just rekey it for things that you want to include in your campaign. And then there's an index at the end. So that was my review of Red Tide. It uses Labyrinth Lord, which is also a free download. So, again, with a lot of the OSR games, you can get like artless versions of them for free. And I think that's probably one of the biggest strengths of the OSR games is that, you know, especially if you have players that are don't really want to spend a lot of money on, on games, you go, well, okay, you don't want to spend a game or spend money on a game. Here's the here's a link. Go print it out on your own uh, PC or you know only the sections you need for character generation, whatever you got to do. But it's there. Go grab it for free. So Red Tide, I recommend it. I like island settings. This has a post-apocalyptic sort of uh, feel in the outskirts there. There's some secrets about how it all works. Um, the Shao can be like the, the orcs, the they're always evil type things, or you can make it more complicated. And some of the player characters would have some empathy towards their plight of being a, a native culture and having a bunch of humans invade. So take it as it is run it the way you like, but I highly recommend it, so I don't really have a rating guide, but two thumbs up, whatever. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. I'll talk to you guys later.